My guest today on the Science Studio is Steven Pinker, who is the Johnston Family Professor at Harvard University, who was at MIT before that. Um, he's a well-known cognitive scientist who works in language, and he's perhaps best known for a trilogy of books. Uh, the first one, The Language Instinct, second, How the Mind Works, and the third one, uh, which is the reason he's here today, is The Stuff of Thought. Um, Steve, welcome. Thank you. Um, as I see you arrive, and I know the punishing tour that you're on, I wonder sometimes why people do this sort of thing. <laughs> I'm actually going to read you a quote from Ernest Becker. Do you remember who Ernest Becker was? Well-known psychologist. Death? Yes, The Denial of Death. Yes. And Ernest Becker said in front, front of one of his books, I have reached far beyond my competence and have probably secured for good a reputation for flamboyant gestures. But the times still crowd me and give me no rest, and I see no way to avoid ambitious synthetic attempts. Either we get some kind of grip on the accumulation of thought or we continue to wallow helplessly, to starve amidst plenty. So I gamble with science and write. <laughs> that's, uh, that's terrific. What's your reason? <laughs> I, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, well, I enjoy sharing the excitement of the ideas that, that I work with, that my field has developed. Uh, and I do think there is something uh, ennobling about knowledge, uh, in this case, knowledge about ourselves, about our nature. Yeah. I think, as Chekhov said, man will be better when you show him what he is like. And uh, it's thrilling to be part of a, this collective enterprise of trying to uh, crack the puzzle of how the mind works. Um, you are, would now be called, I think you actually have been called, a, a public intellectual. You're one of the people who communicate uh, you are the face of one of the f people who the, represent the face of science. Um, there's responsibilities with that. Um, how does that feel? I mean, is this a role that you were looking for? Is this something you sought? Or is this a mantle you bear at this point? I mean, <laughs> how do you see it? Uh, well, neither one. I didn't set out trying to be a, a public intellectual. You can't go to graduate school to be <laughs> to do. You can't major in being a pub public intellectual. Uh, but I don't, I don't find it onerous. I find it uh, flattering that people would be interested in my thoughts or analyses on particular issues. And I try to, to use it in a, in a uh, way that I think would be uh, enlightening, responsible, getting people to at least see a problem more clearly, whether or not they agree with my particular analysis of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure that we get this, this on the record, and since you are laboring to, to persuade people to go and at least acquire a copy of the stuff of thought, what's the burden of this particular volume? And what's, what's, the, what's the point, the, the, the major thrust of it. Well, the subtitle is Language as a Window into Human Nature. And I've written books on language. I've written books on human nature. This is the one that uses language as a lens into, into the brain, uh, in a way. What can we learn about the human concept of uh, space from the way prepositions work? What can we learn about our concept of time from the way tense works? What can we learn about emotion and taboo from swear words? What can we learn about social relationships from innuendo and politeness and other ways in which people don't blurt out what they mean but veil their intentions in, in doublespeak? Uh, one of, these are some of a number of ways in which puzzles of language, I think, force you to uh, understand something about what makes us tick. Okay. What's your position on language? Do you think that's a uniquely human attribute? I think uh, the, the answer to that depends on, on <laughs> how you define the word language. But do I think that uh, that uh, human language is uh, has unique features in the animal kingdom? Uh, yes, I think it does. That is, I think that a, a lot of very special. Uh, things happened in the six million years since we split off from the common ancestor of chimpanzees. I don't think communication is unique to humans. Clearly it isn't. Animals you know, jabber and call and signal in many ways. But I think grammatical language, that is, conveying a proposition by the way in which you arrange symbols for the concepts that make up that proposition, mm -hmm. in such a way that the meaning of the signal depends not just on the elements, but the way they're arranged, and that where there's an open-ended system uh, of uh, giving you an ability to express an unlimited number of ideas, that I think is unique to humans. When we first talked on television, at least, it's over a decade ago now, 
<clears throat> we were talking, you just had got the galleys back of the language instinct. So there's, a, there's obviously a continuity here. Um, the language instinct, could you elaborate what you mean by an instinct? Yes, well, the, the title comes from a quote from Charles Darwin. Man has an instinctive tendency to speak, as we see in the babble of our young children, uh, whereas no child has an instinctive tendency to bake, brew, or write. Uh, and I think that captured the sense in which language has some uh, evolved innate basis, an idea that's much more closely associated with Noam Chomsky, uh, but that I think Darwin said first. And I think even though, uh, as Darwin himself continued, he called it an instinct to acquire an art, which was mm -hmm. the title of the first chapter, clearly what we inherit is not a particular language or a set of words or constructions, but the ability to combine uh, words according to grammatical rules, uh, I think, is a, a special feature of, of the human brain, something that is a product of evolution, even if the content itself has to be filled in by our community. This is a, obviously a, a, a larger debate which goes at one extreme, nature versus nurture, uh, one extreme, constructivism, whether, you, whether you're constructing representations to, of, of ideas and so on and so forth, or whether they are innate, innately given, even possibly an expansion of something represented in the genome. Um, I don't particular. I think the details of that would be too complex for us to sort of spend much time on now, and, and the controversy will, will will range on. But what's your? How do you differ from Chomsky on this? I mean, do you actually think there is such a thing as um, an innate module for language? I, I wouldn't call it a module because it is so. Uh, interwoven with other parts of uh, 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 other parts of the, the mind, uh, language has to be connected to perceptual faculties so that we can uh, hear and read to uh, short-term memory so that we can keep in mind what we how we intend to complete a sentence uh, as we begin it with social cognition so that we can choose our words to maintain a relationship uh, so instead of the word module I like the word uh, uh, a mental organ which is actually from Chomsky to give credit where it's due uh, in the same way that uh, the blood is an organ, even though you can't draw a dotted line around it, and it obviously uh, interacts with many other parts of the body. Uh, I, the word I prefer is, to modularity is specialization. That is, uh, it's a complex system. It's got uh, parts that work in particular ways to do particular jobs and to talk to one another. The brain is not spam. It's not a, uh, there's no single principle that governs learning in all domains, I, I would argue. Uh, but that doesn't commit you to a bunch of snap-in modules that, uh, that don't talk to each other either. Mm -hmm. But an evolved specialization. Yeah. What's the best theory we have at the moment about how such a specialization might have evolved? I mean, what are the... You mean at the, the, pressures, genetic, the, the, pressures the genetic are, level or yeah. the selection pressures? Yeah. This, the, the genetic level, we don't know, although I think we're, go we're going to learn because with the revolution in genomic tools, we'll be able to find genes that have more of an effect on language than on other faculties and uh, using statistical patterns in the genome, uh, see whether and when selective forces uh, uh, fix those genes in our genome. That's already been done with, uh, with at least one gene that seems to have a large effect on uh, speech and grammar. Uh, in terms of the selective pressures, I think that's, uh, that's a much clearer because we know that any intelligent system benefits from being able to exchange information with other intelligent systems. That's why the internet makes a computer more powerful than if it was just sitting unplugged from, from, the, from the net. Uh, we know from simulations that intelligent agents are under a selective pressure to be able to pool information with one another. Uh, and we know that humans are uh, unusual, not just in having language, but in two other traits that are also unusual in the animal kingdom and that are exactly what would make language most useful. Number one, we acquire a lot of knowledge about our environment.